Hello and welcome to Sick Notes. My name's Ed Hope, I'm a junior doctor in the UK and you guys seem to really enjoy my look at the medical science behind Doctor Strange. So to celebrate the release of Avengers Endgame, the end of the first chapter of the amazing Marvel Cinematic Universe, I thought I'd revisit a scene from every single film in the MCU. The thing is, when I started re-watching them, I realized there was so much to talk about. So I've already reviewed um, all the phase one films of everything from Iron Man to Avengers Assemble. So I'm gonna be releasing the videos over the course of this week. Some of the movies I might put in the same video, my thoughts, because there wasn't as much to talk about. But I'm gonna talk about kind of any medical science that pops up, any hospital scenes, maybe talk a bit more about the superhero's powers and how they might work and break down any injuries as well. So I'm gonna start with where it all kicked off with Robert Downey Jr. in Iron Man. So it all started here with Tony Stark getting injured by his own weapons. The explosion and the sound editing of this ringing in the ears, a common thing you see in filmmaking actually, it's demonstrating a primary blast injury causing noise-induced hearing loss. Any injuries from explosions we define as primary if they're caused by the sheer forces of the actual explosion itself secondary from any shrapnel or anything thrown in the blast that injures you, and tertiary if anything from the blast wind throws you onto something and you get an injury that way. So this is a primary blast injury causing hearing loss. The sheer pressure from the force is conducted all the way through the ear. It might perforate the eardrum on the way, and it goes all the way to the cochlea where the tiny hairs in the ear sense hearing. They can actually be damaged by this extreme force, and it, this could be permanent or it could be temporary. Okay, and so now we see a secondary blast injury. So Tony's been hit by the shrapnel that's come from the explosion of the bomb that's gone in his body, causing the bleeding. We then see some flashes of his surgery and then some gauze over his face. So nice little touch to show how Tony's general anesthetic was administered for the operation. So what made him unconscious? So there are a bunch of chemicals that would do this called volatile anesthetic. So they turn from a liquid to a gas very quickly. So you can put the liquid onto some gauze, put it over over someone's face as it vaporizes and turns to a gas people would inhale it and it would have its general anesthetic effects the most famous chemical being chloroform although we don't use that one anymore <laughs> So anyone who's ever worked on a ward in a hospital will tell you people always rip out things, you know, tubes and lines that are coming out of their bodies when they get a bit confused. In this instance, the general anaesthetic that Tony's been having would diffuse into the fat of the body. So even after it's administered, it would take a while for the body to break it down and to get rid of it from the body. So although he may regain consciousness, he won't be fully all there. So he may be a bit confused and a bit aggressive as well and lead to him pulling out the lines. And this tube he pulled out is a naso gastric tube or NG tube, very common in medicine. Naso because of nose, gastric because it goes through to the stomach and gastric is a term we use in medicine for anything to do with the stomach. As I said, NG tubes are very common. We often put them in for feeding or if we need to suck the contents of the stomach out if there's been like a blockage in the gut or anything like that. What I did is to save your life. I removed all the shrapnel I could. There's a lot left and it's headed into your atrial septum. Okay, so we find out that the secondary blast injury has put shrapnel and debris into the chest and around the heart, specifically heading toward the atrial septum. So here is your heart and the septum is this muscular wall right down the middle that divides the left side from the right side of the heart. The septum is also where you can have defects in and that's often called having a hole in your heart. So just to remind you, we have our atria at the top of the heart. Their job is to fill the ventricles beneath them and then we have the ventricles down below. So the job of the left ventricle is to pump blood 
round the body and the job of the right ventricle is to pump blood to the lungs for oxygenation. So Tony's got shrapnel threatening to invade the atrial septum. So it will be this part of the septum here that divides the two atria. A very important structure in this area is the atrioventricular node or AV node. It's part of the electrical conduction system of the heart. It delays the signal from the atria to the ventricles, giving the ventricles time to fill up before they then contract and send blood to the lungs and to the body. Therefore, it kind of makes sense that any shrapnel or metal barbs invading into the septum could disrupt the electrical activity of the heart and put the heart in funny rhythms, which could cause a cardiac arrest. I've seen many wounds like that in my village. We call them the walking dead because it takes about a week for the barbs to reach the vital organs. What is this? So shrapnel moving through the body. Well, I, I guess the weapons here have been designed to kind of work their way through the body, which is pretty sick. In reality, any deep shrapnel would generally just stay in the same place that it came to rest. And there'd be a risk of infection as with any foreign object that enters the body. But over time, the shrapnel would just get walled off by the immune system. However, there are plenty of examples of shrapnel entering the body somewhere and being embedded somewhere and then ended up traveling around the body. So it does check out. Using an electromagnet to stop the barbs traveling further through the body. I'm not so sure because it would take weeks to months to maybe even years for some shrapnel to erode through the body. But as we said here, the weapon's probably designed to do that. So maybe it can do it very quickly, you know, minutes to hours. So that's why Tony needs to be permanently connected to the electromagnet. Come on, we gotta go. Move with me, come on, we got a plan, we're gonna stick to it. This was always the plan, stop. Come on, you gotta go see your family, get it. So a tender moment here between Tony Stark and Dr. Jensen. And this is nicely handled because normally in action movies like this, when someone's dying, the hero should be, you know, trying to stop the bleeding or trying to do something medically to keep them alive. But Dr. Jensen expresses that he doesn't want any treatment. He doesn't want to be saved. He doesn't want to be resuscitated. And people have the right to determine what happens to them, even if it means they come to harm. So Tony Stark ends up blasting away in the first Iron Man suit and ends up in a dead Desert, probably suffering from birds, major trauma, then extreme sun exposure, and likely dehydration. All of these things that would need hospital admission. Eventually rescued, and he's no doubt been via a military hospital before we next see him to rule out any kind of medical emergencies for assessment and also probably for some fluid resuscitation too. And we next see him arriving in a broad arm sling. That's a kind of common thing we use for any forearm fractures or any soft tissue injuries to the arm as well. It doesn't look like his arm's in plaster, so he's probably got a soft tissue injury of the right arm. And here we see Tony refusing to go to hospital. Tony, you, no, you have to go answer. to the hospital. I don't the doctor have to do anything. To I've been in you. captivity for three months. As we said earlier, people have the right to determine what happens to them. They have the right to refuse medical treatment. Is it too right. much of a problem to ask? Because I'm, I'm... Okay, okay. I really need your help here. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. there's pus. It's not pus. It's an, you know, <laughs> kind of plasmic discharge. It's from the device, not from my body. It smells. Yeah, it does. The copper wire. <laughs> So you realize here how freaking deep the arc reactor sort of casing goes into the body. So it would have had to go through the sternum, so through the breastbone, and obviously displace a load of the tissues beneath the chest. So the heart, a load of the blood vessels around the heart, the lungs, even the esophagus as well, your food pipe. Although the arc is embedded in the chest, it doesn't open out into the chest, which makes complete sense because that would be a massive infection risk whenever we put implantable device into people. People, for example, a pacemaker, it would go completely under the skin. Reason being is that we don't want to introduce infection through the device. Your skin's a really important barrier against the outside world and against infection. That couldn't happen in the art reactor as it currently stands because it needs to be switched out and changed, which obviously you couldn't do if the device was under the skin. A couple things, you'd still 100% wash your hands and wear gloves and clean the area you were using, even though it's essentially outside of the body, because it can still be a vessel for contracting infection. 
and anything that we put in the body, if it does get infected, it, you never lose the infection, even with antibiotics. That's why uh, any kind of implants, like hip implants, or as I say, pacemakers, we are so, so worried about infection with them. And we see Tony's hooked up to an ECG here, so monitoring the electrical activity of the heart with those electrodes we see on his chest, although they're in the slightly the wrong place, so the black should be on the left and the white should be on the right. That wouldn't make a huge difference, it would just change what the wave looked like slightly. Make sure then when you pull it out, you don't pull out the, the, the magnet. At the end of it, that was it. You just pulled out. Okay. Oh, God. I was okay. not expecting it. Don't what put do it back do? in. What don't do put I... it back in. What's wrong? Oh, nothing. I'm just going in a cardiac arrest. <laughs> So Pepper Potts pulls out the copper coil that's part of the electromagnet. We said that we wouldn't expect the shrapnel to erode into the heart that quickly, but it's purposefully built to do that. So we can see that it's eroding in and has caused an a problem with the electrical conduction system. Tony's worried about a cardiac arrest, so a cardiac arrest is where your heart has functionally stopped. It can have different rhythms, but it essentially means there's no blood coming out of the heart. We know Tony's not currently in a cardiac arrest because he's conscious, so there must be some blood getting to his brain. So then we hear the heart monitor beeping very fast. Take this, take this. Okay. And there's no way of knowing exactly what rhythm he's in without seeing an ECG, but I'm guessing it's ventricular tachycardia. Now this is when the ventricles down here start beating very quickly all on their own. Ventricular tachycardia can be a cardiac arrest rhythm in itself. By that I mean it can, these can beat in a way that no blood comes out of the heart. But Tony would be unconscious there. As he said, he's only going into cardiac arrest. He's not currently in cardiac arrest. Ventricular tachycardia is still a medical emergency, even if someone's conscious, because it can degrade into a cardiac arrest rhythm very quickly. So what do we do? Well, if the patient's stable, we'd give them medications that help restore the electrical coordination of the heart. And if the patient's unstable, we'd strap them up to a defibrillator and give them a shock, which would reset all the electrical activity of the heart, which is exactly what we see here. Is that so hard? Nice little scene there to explain what's going on and a little bit of medical science as well. This was a board of directors meeting. This this was a board of directors meeting? The board is claiming a post-traumatic stress. They're filing an injunction. A what? Okay, so we hear that the board and Obadiah Stain are claiming that Tony might have post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. They may have a point given all the stuff that Tony Stark's gone through. So let's do a quick evaluation using the DSM-5. So that's the kind of Bible of mental health diseases. So all of these must be true for a diagnosis of PTSD um, to be made. Okay, A, exposure to a traumatic event definitely happened. <laughs> One of involuntary and upsetting memory of event, repeated upsetting dreams of event, flashbacks, distressed about cues relating to the event. Yeah, I believe that checks out. Avoidance of anything that would trigger memories of the event. I don't think so. You know, he even went back to Afghanistan to kind of where it all happened. Didn't also seem very traumatized when he had his arc reactor replaced either. But any three of the inability to remember an important part of what happened, low self-esteem, self-blame, shame, anger, fear, loss of enjoyment of activities, feeling detached, inability to feel happy. Kind of, he does blame himself because he used his own weapons. Um, and I don't think he has full memory either, but certainly some of the other things, not so much. Any three of aggressive behavior, impulsive behavior, hypervigilance, uh, aggression, certainly that. <laughs> Symptoms greater than a month, interfering with life. Well, I mean, it's had a massive change on his life, but not necessarily for a bad reason. And the last one, not due to substance misuse or medical diseases. Arguably, he has an alcohol disorder given how much we see him drink and when he drinks. But anyway, he needs all of those things for a diagnosis of PTSD. So I would say, you know, he certainly doesn't have a couple of them. So maybe some traits, but certainly not PTSD. So there you have it, my breakdown of some of the medical sites behind Iron Man. If you enjoyed this, then subscribe to the channel because I'm going to be doing a bunch of the, all the phase one films over the course of this week. So the Hulk in the next couple of days. And if you can't wait that long, then why don't you check out my review of Doctor Strange? A couple of thank yous. Firstly, to my mate Callum, who's a Marvel fan and chucked a bunch of ideas at me of topics I should cover in these videos. 
Caleb has a great YouTube channel. He does visual essays. Recently did one on one of the scenes from Avengers Assemble, actually. So you definitely check that out. I'll leave a link down below and a, a card somewhere up here. So thank you for that, Callum. And also a thank you to a few of my colleagues, Dr. Tom, Dr. James, and Dr. Jake, for watching these videos with me and throwing a few ideas around as well. I really appreciate that. And finally, as always, to the real superheroes, to you guys, thank you for your continued support. You know, I really appreciate it. So until next time, I'll see you soon.